Hello everyone, this is Kat and welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. Today I'll be reading a fic entitled Things That Haunt Our Hallways. This is a two-shot, just shy of 15,000 words, and it's one that I consistently reread. A basic summary for this fic is that Class 1A, while out on a training exercise, is hit by a fear-inducing quirk, and each of them scatter, making it so that Aizawa has to go in by himself and retrieve each of them individually. With that being said, here's Chapter 1. Yagi was barely holding it together when Aizawa arrived. It was a kid. He gasped out. Yagi had his hand balled up into a fist, and it was pressed to his lips, as if to remind himself that he could not start screaming. Or, young person, maybe twenty, homeless, I think, activated their quirk on reflex and then ran. The kids... Here he pressed his fist harder to his mouth, sucked in a wheezing breath as if the air itself was pushing down something with physical weight. The kids... Scattered immediately, Aizawa finished for him and Yagi had managed to nod. Yagi's eyes were so dilated that the blue was almost invisible. He shook violently. He looked like a scarecrow in a wind storm. Someone activated a fear-inducer quirk, so powerful that it reduced all might to this. Of course, Aizawa's class had bolted. I'm sorry, Yagi had gasped out, and his apology did not twist Aizawa's heart. It didn't. I tried to. I, I tried. It's fine, Aizawa said shortly. You got hit with it, too. Not your fault. He turned to face the other direction, moved to walk away. I'm going to go get them. Yagi's hand shot out, wrapped itself around Aizawa's upper arm. Aizawa paused. Midoriya, croaked Yagi. I need to... I need to get Midoriya. Aizawa exhaled. He carefully extracted himself from Yagi's grip. And fuck, he always forgot about how giant Yagi's hands were. Toshinori, I'm going to go get them. He repeated firmer this time. I'll bring them back here. All of them. And then he walked toward the ghost's quarters entrance to do just that. Behind him, Yagi had crumpled into a shaking, shivering pile on the ground. The several-mile stretch of cityscape was called the Ghost Quarter because nobody lived there. It was a remnant from one of Japan's earliest big threat villains named Seismic, who had the ability to control the earth and ground matter was still one of the strongest recorded elemental quirks to ever exist. The Ghost Quarter was the site of the final battle to take him down. It had been hard and gruesome, a shudderingly high casualty number. The damage to the city itself had been astronomical. And because of the strength and nature of Seismic's powers, the damage was also irreversible. The land was fractured down to the bedrock. Geologists had called it a tectonic anomaly, the ground so unstable that any efforts to build anything on it would result in catastrophe. The abandoned cityscape was mostly repurposed for education reasons these days, hero training to support item testing, though if Aizawa was remembering correctly, it was also used as a filming location for movies occasionally, and apparently, it was also considered something of a holy grail for the urban exploration crowd, because it was fairly heavily guarded and difficult to get into. His class had gone there in order to partake in a part of a unit on minimizing collateral damage, his class had been hit by a very powerful fear-inducer quirk. Aizawa couldn't think of a worse group of students to be hit by something like that, his highly trained, deeply traumatized, shockingly codependent problem children. We can't all go in at once, Midnight explained to him. Terrain's too unstable for most of our quirks, or even more than one person, not to mention we don't want to spook the kids any more than they already are. They really, really didn't, and the least likely to spook the students was Eraserhead, who also just so happened to have the ideal quirk for the job. So Aizawa was going in alone. The kids had trackers in their shoes during field trips, a precaution taken after the disaster at their training camp. Mike was on the other monitor, and the comms, a voice in Aizawa's ear to direct him to them one at a time. Go in, find his students, one at a time, knock them out by breaking a capsule of midnight somnambulisk work, which could last about half an hour, away from her body. Send up a signal, and another teacher would carefully pick their way to the sleeping kid and bring them to the base outside the ghost quarter while Aizawa had moved on to the next one. Simple plan. A good plan, even. It was just the one part that made Aizawa's chest ache. One at a time. He stood at the entrance to the quarter, exhaled. You can hear me, Eraser? Mike's voice in his ear, checking the comms, grounding in its own right. You're coming in fine, he responded. He pulled his goggles down over his eyes more out of habit than anything else, and then pulled a rebreather over his nose and mouth so he wouldn't breathe in the somnambulist himself. I got the kids on the monitor, said Mike. Who are we going after first? Aizawa ignored the knee-jerk responses, the part of him that was screaming all of them, all of them at once, all nineteen right away. 
breathe, compartmentalize, be rational. He knew these kids. That was the reason why they were sending him and not midnight. Who's on the move, Mike? Aizawa asked. Right now? A pause and Mike looked over the monitors, the tiny blipping dots of his terrified, panicking students. Currently moving are Ashido, Ida, and Bakugo. Rational, Shota, he repeated to himself. Head, not heart. Never heart in a situation like this, at least not yet. Think about each of the kids, the terrain, the threats, who was in the most danger. He listened to the world around him. He couldn't hear any explosions. Ida first, said Aizawa, and then took off to where Mike's voice had guided him. All Idas ran like joy. They ran like running was the only thing that freed them. They ran like it was a struggle every day to keep themselves moving at a walk, like they constantly forced themselves to move at the speed of others until the moment they kicked off the ground. Sensei ran like laughter, back when they were all in school, like easy jokes and gentle teasing and sure win, low stakes bet, usually poking unsuspecting underclassmen into a doomed foot race. Chenya, Aizawa had discovered over the course of teaching him, ran like an exhale, like tension leaving the shoulders, like the only time he wasn't thinking and worrying about a hundred different things was in the second before the run started. That was not how Tenya was running now. This was the stuttering, desperate gait of someone who knew exactly what they had to lose and was certain they were seconds away from losing it. It was twisted and painful, not anything Aizawa ever wanted to see on his 15-year-old student. Aizawa managed to keep pace with him, but barely. He needed to do this fast, a lesson well remembered from Tensei's laughing bets. Only fools thought they could beat Anita in an actual endurance race, even a terrified teenage Dita, or maybe especially a terrified teenage Dita. Tenya ran back to campus from USJ, after all. Ida, he attempted. Yagi had been fairly coherent under his sphere, after all. No response. Ida's eyes were unfocused and glazed, darting to things that didn't exist, that Aizawa couldn't see. Ida Tenya, he tried again, hoping the more personal aspect of a first name would help. Then maybe the shock of his teacher being so familiar would be enough to get the kid to look at him and see him. Ida had skidded to a stop, then used his momentum and impressive hip pivot to deliver what would have been a cheekbone crushing punch to the face had Aizawa been a little slower. Thankfully, Aizawa was not a little slower, and Ida was panicking enough that his aim was sloppy. Aizawa ducked under the arm and performed a well practiced move, capture weapon up and around the arm, roll to one side, pull the attacker off balance. Ida fell and sprawled, another indication that whatever he was seeing, it wasn't his teacher. Aizawa sent out the other end of his capture weapon to bind his feet and keep him still. He was not prepared for Ida to keen or start struggling with a kind of desperation which cracked bones. He kicked out with both his bound feet, and Aizawa threw himself backward to avoid impact. Release me, Ida snarled, his voice breaking. His eyes were wild and unfocused, seeing something obviously, but not anything real. Let go of me. He struggled like he was drowning, like the only thing which would make him breathe again was getting up onto his feet and continuing to run, where Aizawa couldn't know. He didn't even know if he was running away or running toward. Ida, you're under the influence of a quirk. Aizawa tried once more in a desperate hope that it would work the third time. Ida responded by yanking and twisting his arm that was caught in the scarf, straining it in a way that Aizawa knew would pull ligaments if he didn't put a stop to it. He shook one of the somnambulist capsules in his hand, flicked the rebreather around his neck, up to his nose and his mouth, and then lunged forward to immobilize the student before he could hurt himself. Aizawa got one hand on Ida's shoulder, cracked the capsule, and held him as he struggled as the gas had disseminated through the air. And then Ida started crying. Deep, chest-rattling sobs, bubbling out of him in time with his weakening thrashing against Aizawa's hands as Midnight's quirk took effect. I need... Ida gulped out, tears on the edge of his voice. I need to get there in time. I cannot fail him. I cannot fail him. I need to get there. Everyone is... Everyone is going to... He was falling still now, struggling against his heavy eyelids. You got there, Ida. Aizawa found himself murmuring to him. You did it. Everything's fine. Just go to sleep and I'll take care of the rest. I can't... Sleep. With one last weak thrash against his teacher's hands, Ida's eyes fell shut and his body went slack. Aizawa carefully slid Ida's glasses off his face and put them into the front pocket of his uniform. He tapped the comm link on. Ida secured, he said. Send somebody to get him. Ectoplasm's already moving, Eraser, said Mike. Who are we going to next? Aizawa took a moment to center himself. Again, rational, he reminded himself. Rational. Aizawa knew his kids. He'd gone to Ida first because he knew there was no way Ida would react to fear this intense in any way but running. He knew that of all the students, Ida was the only one who had a chance of slipping out of the ghost quarter. 
or colliding directly with one of the electric fences on the perimeter. Aizawa listened. He heard no explosions still. He knew his kids. Bring me to Tokiyami, he said. Aizawa saw Dark Shadow before he saw Tokiyami, rising over the crumbling wall of a ruined building, thrashing back and forth like a particularly well-coordinated swarm of bees, larger than he usually was, but Aizawa expected that. Aizawa also knew what Dark Shadow did when his human had panicked, and it was an overcast day, which didn't help. He only wondered why they were staying so stationary. He vaulted the wall, and the answer made his stomach drop. Tokiyami must have found some kind of electrical wire in the building's rubble. He had used it to lash his right hand, from wrist to elbow, to a piece of rebar which warped its way up through the foundation. Whenever Dark Shadow had reached the limit of its range, Tokiyami lurched forward but did not move. The wire was biting into his skin. Right beneath the notch of his wrist, a cut was bleeding sluggishly. Aizawa took another hesitant step forward. At the sound of his footfall, Dark Shadow screeched and swooped in closer, and Tokiyami cringed away from him, curling closer to the crumbling wall. "'Don't come any closer!' he cried out, voice breaking like a dropped glass. "'Stay away from me. I'm going to hurt you.' Aizawa dropped into an easy crouch, and Dark Shadow passed above him with a pained roar. "'Tokiyami. Mr. Aizawa, please stay back.' Aizawa froze momentarily, not expecting the kid to be able to recognize him. "'I'm going to hurt you,' Tokiyami said again more to himself this time than to Aizawa. "'I'm going to hurt you. I always end up hurting someone. I always make things worse.' Tokiyami was one of Aizawa's more reserved students. His dramatics, while present, because Aizawa had yet to meet a fifteen-year-old without dramatics, were understated and turned inward. He was quiet about his emotions feeling them deeply but rarely expressing the need to share them with the entire world around him the way that, say, Kirishima did. This level of panic and self-hatred was uncharted. Aizawa moved another step forward, slowly. Dark Shadow flew straight up and Tokiyami arched as the end of their range was hit. He sucked in a long, pained breath. I can't control him. I can't control him. Tokiyami's voice had faded into muttering over and over a mantra to keep time to the way that he rocked himself back and forth. He buried his beak in his knees. I'm going to hurt you. I can't control him. Aizawa looked up at how high off the ground Dark Shadow was. He measured the distance between himself and Tokiyami, thought back to the last time they'd tested Dark Shadow's reflex speed and hero training. Sometimes, even for underground heroics, the best course of action was the most direct one. Aizawa ducked low and darted forward. The capsule of Somnambulist was already in between his fingers. Dark Shadow dove up towards him, eyes feral, streamlined into a perfect dive bomb, Tokiyami curled himself closer to his bound arm, a no tearing itself from his throat like it was something alive. Aizawa cracked the capsule, tossed it with the precision of all his years as a pro, and rolled to the side as Dark Shadow had approached the ground. Tokiyami gasped in twice on a sob. His beak was still buried in his knees, but each breath brought the somnambulist even deeper into his lungs. Aizawa dodged another strike by Dark Shadow, but already he was slowing. Midnight's quirk worked fast. Tokiyami inhaled again and then started to sway. I'm sorry, he said. I'm so sorry, Sensei. It's okay, Tokiyami. It's okay. Aizawa watched Dark Shadow sink back to his person. Nobody got hurt. You did well, kid. Tokiyami swayed against the bindings on his arms, and Dark Shadow was nearly back to his usual size, butting up against Tokiyami's damp cheek like a strange little cat. I'm sorry, the kid murmured out one more time before going absolutely limp, breath evened out in sleep. Aizawa moved. The wire was now taking far too much of Tokiyami's body weight, forcing his arm into an awkward angle and cutting directly into his skin. He sliced through the wire with his knife in one smooth motion, and then caught the kid as he slumped to the ground. Aizawa could have gone his entire life without knowing how tears made Tokiyami's feathers clump. He tapped his calm, but Mike was already speaking. Sending someone to his location now, Eraser. Do we have a medic at the gates? Yep, said Mike. And recovery girls on standby, once we get all your chicks home. Okay, good. Aizawa carefully folded Tokiyami's injured arm to his chest. Tokiyami's going to need bandages, at the very least. You got it. After one last moment spent at Tokiyami's side, Aizawa got to his feet. Mike gave him a moment to think. Too safe now. Bakugo next. He knew he could trust Bakugo not to instantly start blasting. His student had his fair share of issues, God knew, but quirk control was not one of them. Aizawa had seen Bakugo shrug his way through situations which traditionally caused quirk control to slip in children his age, being startled, an unexpected blow, stress, dealing with too much sensory information. From what Aizawa understood, Bakugo essentially spent his entire childhood focused on little else except quirk control and perception. 
He knew how to make his explosions dangerous, but that also meant he was well-practiced at making his explosions safe. So Aizawa knew that he'd have enough time to get to Ida, his flight risk, and Tokiyami, whose quirk reacted so poorly to heightened negative emotions, before he moved to Bakugo. That being said, a quirk like that in a terrain this unstable was a recipe for disaster, and Aizawa needed to move quickly. In his ear, Mike said. He's moving between three buildings to the right of you. Keeping to the ground floors mostly. Got it. Aizawa moved to the center of the street. He dropped his stealth training, made his footsteps heavy and consistent, kicked some pebbles and debris around as he went. He stopped, body loose, senses heightened, and ready. You can come out now, Aizawa called, voice echoing. Come on, I know you're hiding. Interesting strategy, muttered Mike, but Aizawa ignored him. Come out, Kotsky, he said again, adding just a touch of mocking to his voice this time. You know what's going on here on some level. You're smart enough for that. Come out. A long silence followed, and then an entire teenage boy rocketed out of the lower window of the building closest to him, shoulders turned to shield his neck and arm outstretched, sparks jumping off of his fingers, a scream on his lips. Aizawa pivoted toward him, erasure flaring to life and capture weapon flying around. The sparks died on Bakugo's fingertips, but his movement didn't stop. He ducked under the ribbony white material and continued his charge. Fuck you! Bakugo roared around a cracking voice. He tried a blow to the solar plexus, which Aizawa weaved away from. Finally decided to fight me like a man, huh? Instead of slinking around corners and whispering shitty threats like some B-movie villain. Get some new fucking material, I've heard it all before. Slinking around corners and whispering shitty threats. The buildings Bakugo had been running between loomed over them. Aizawa's heart clenched. What had the kid been running from in there? What poured out of his own head to chase him through ruined hallways? Bakugo fell back to prepare for another attack, and Aizawa got his first good look at the kid. There was dirt and ash smeared on his face, and the collar of his gym uniform was ripped, but otherwise he'd seemed blissfully unharmed, at least physically. Bakugo's mouth was twisted into a wild snarl. His pupils were dangerously blown. He was looking in Aizawa's direction, but his gaze was not locked on his teacher's face. It was as if he thought that he was facing off against an opponent significantly taller than Aizawa. He probably did. Bakugo reached out with his hands behind him, to propel himself forward. But he was still caught in erasure. Aizawa watched his student's hands clench and tremble. What did you do to my quirk, you sick bastard? He ground out. It's me, Bakugo, Aizawa said. It's a razor head. You know what my quirk does. Don't give me that crap, Bakugo snarled back, and Aizawa gave up on getting the kid to see him. I don't care what you did to me. I can beat you anyway. Then he rushed in again. Sloppy, the kind of combat that Aizawa would... Tear apart if they were in training, but they weren't. He wished they were. Aizawa got his capture weapon, around one wrist, and then he spun the kid around into a restraining pin. His arm barred over Bakugo's chest. Bakugo began to struggle like a wild thing trapped in a snare, snarling like one as well, and Aizawa cracked the somnambulist's capsule in one palm, cupped it over the kid's face, forcing him to breathe it in. Let go of me, Bakugo had gasped out, still yanking even as he slowed. Fucking... Let go of me. I'm not going to let you take me again. You're not going to take me again. No. No. Shit. No. Fuck, Deku, stay back. And then Bakugo's legs gave out, and he relaxed in his teacher's arms, dead asleep. I saw what careful as a surgeon laid him on the ground. He knew what was chasing Bakugo through those buildings now, at least. Mike's voice broke the moment low and familiar in his ear. That was rough, show. Codenames in the field, I saw said automatically. He had to be a racer head right now. If he took even a moment to be Hisashi's show, he'd never be able to get through this. Understood, said Mike, because he did. Someone's en route to him now. Where to next, Eraserhead? He had to keep going. Thankfully, some of his students were simpler to subdue. Ojiro and Hagakure ended up teaming up, finding some place stable with most of the walls intact, setting up an impressive, if feverishly put together, defense. They seemed to think that they were back at the USJ. Each of them took turns pushing the other behind them, desperate movements of protection. The teacher part of Aizawa's brain, which never seemed to shut off these days, noted to pair the two up during more exercises as the distract opponent with head-on, aggressive combat, while the human embodiment of stealth brains them from behind was a decent utility strategy, even if it was less effective as the two of them became slower and groggier from Midnight's Quirk. They didn't think about how their shared last moment before sleep took them was still spent raising their arms to defend each other. Aizawa also found Sato and Aoyama, of all people together, both kneeling in the shadow to fill the alleyway. They don't even notice his approach. That was a terrifying thing in its own right. Sato stared fixedly at the wall, 
on the other side of the alley, shaking like a child's wind-up toy. As Aizawa got closer, he could see the raised lines on both of Sato's bare arms, obvious marks of his own nails, raking up and down his skin. He couldn't do that anymore, though, because Aoyama had tangled their fingers together and was squeezing them. Sato kept pulling, trying to get his nails back to his arms, but Aoyama squeezed tighter each time. Non, Manami, he was saying over and over again, feverish and desperate. None of that. Stop. Look at me. We're going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. Aizawa felt nothing but relief when both of their eyes had closed. His first surprise was this. Ashido came to him, like a bat out of hell, launching an attack that surpassed Bakugo's in viciousness. She was going to be a truly spectacular close combat fighter once she grew into herself. She already was now, not giving him an inch, using her size and flexibility to their full advantages. Aizawa had to nearly fold himself in half backwards to avoid an acid-coated hand to the face. He sent his scarf toward her, and she had twirled away like it was choreographed. Ashido's eyes snapped to his face, as panicked and vacant as the rest of his kids. Do not fucking touch me! She snarled, like a wild, feral thing, the sweet and sunny girl who bothered him about his coffee habits, and taught her classmates how to dance was nowhere to be seen. Leave me alone. If you put your fucking hands on me, I will rip off your fingers with my teeth. And then she charged him again, running directly into the somnambulist that Aizawa had just cracked between them. He caught her with his capture weapon, not his hands. He laid her gently onto the ground and requested that specifically Midnight come to get her. He went to Yayorozu next and cursed himself when he saw her because this he should have known. This he should have predicted. He should have come to her sooner. She was nearly emaciated, slumped in the center of a ruined room surrounded by first aid materials, emergency supplies, water bottles, radios, anything and everything a rescue operation could need. She seemed much smaller than she was. She had her hands tucked to her chest as if searching for more. She was quietly weeping. Aizawa took several more steps into the room. Yayorozu did not look up. He dropped into a crouch, so they were eye level. He activated a ratio before she could hurt herself any more. Yagurozu, he said quietly. Her head snapped up. She looked at him with utter devastation in her eyes. Mr. Aizawa, she said, tears falling steadily down her cheeks. I'm so, so sorry. Kid, what are you? I don't think I'm going to have enough to give. She looked at the objects around her. Her tears splashed onto the floor. I don't think it's enough, Sensei. I'm so sorry. Aizawa took a capsule out of his utility belt and rolled it onto his palm. Yayorozu, I promise you, he said. It's more than enough. And he cracked the capsule. She was still crying when she slumped to the ground. Kaminari was an expressive kid, high energy, easy to read, usually smiling. His low moods were uniquely easy to deal with among his peers. A gruff assurance that Aizawa knew he was trying and valued that above anything else, a chance to try again, a compliment toward his perseverance and progress, and then pushing him toward his friends to be hugged and jumped on. Even then, it wasn't something that Aizawa found himself having to do very often. Kaminari was also a pretty happy kid. Kaminari was currently crying so hard that he couldn't move. Pressed into a corner, with his knees to his chest and his forehead to his knees, the kid was crying, chest shaking, silent tears. His fists were knotted into his hair. He didn't make a sound, no whimpers, no keens, just desperate breaths inward around sobs. Little licks of yellow electricity jumped from his skin any time that Aizawa got close. Aizawa didn't call out to him. That was more likely to startle him than anything else, and the last thing either of them needed was a full hit of Kaminari's electricity. He put the kid to sleep and listened to himself soothe like a toddler, calming his own sobbing as he had dozed off, as if he'd done it a thousand times before. Aizawa pulled feathers from his hair, lips pulling up into a scowl as he did. Koda called out instinctively to wildlife when he was that frightened. They responded as if he was one of their young. Aizawa fucking hated pigeons. Not a word, Mike. He growled over the comms as he leaned over Koda to make sure that he was unharmed. There was a small bump on his head, probably from falling during a desperate run, but he seemed otherwise fine, thankfully. Wasn't going to say a thing, Mike said, like the fucking liar that he was. Right, Aizawa snorted, purposely cold. He checked his utility belt and then hit the comm again. I need to come back to the gate. Have to get some more somnambulist. I'm all out. Let Midnight know. I'll see you in a few. Eraserhead, wait. Mike cut in, voice so serious that Aizawa froze. I'm about to give you a location. You're close. You need to go and get Midoriya. I just told you, Aizawa said, that I need to go back and get more. No, Eraserhead, you need to go and get Midoriya now. Aizawa's blood went cold. Why? Because he's very high up. 
On the list of things Aizawa never wanted to see in his life, Midori Izuku dangling his legs off the side of a building's roof was in the top ten. Aizawa stepped carefully, so carefully, closer to his student slumped back, his traitorous fucking heart in his throat. He noted Midoriya's white-knuckled grip on the parapet wall that he was perched on top of. He could not startle him. He had to do this exactly right. Midoriya, he risked speaking. Hey, problem child, could you come back from the edge for me? Midori kicks his legs a few times like a child dipping their legs off of a dock. Hey, Mr. Aizawa, he said, voice oddly flat. What are you doing here? Aizawa took another cautious step forward. I'm here to get you, Midoriya. Come back now. Midori tilted his head, as if he was hearing something, but not Aizawa. His eyes were horrifyingly blank. It was nice. For a while. He said in that same blank conversational tone, as if he wasn't at the edge of a fucking roof. What was nice? Aizawa asked, edging closer. Keep him talking. Keep him talking. He needed to get closer. Being worth something, Midori said, and Aizawa felt a crack fissure open deep inside of himself. What? The words slipped from his lips almost without his consent. Midori had shrugged. It was nice to be worth something. Aizawa moved with slow, surgical precision. That's right, Midori. You're very important to a lot of people. A slow, smooth shake of his head. I won't be any more. That's not true. God, why did the kid have to choose to come this high up? It is. It's okay, Mr. Aizawa. He turned his head to face his teacher, face still horribly blank. For the first time all day, Aizawa had wished for a crying child. He knew what to do with a crying Midoriya. You don't need to lie. I know that I'm nothing. I don't matter. Never have. It was stupid to think that it could change. The kid twitched then, not, in retrospect, an actual sway forward, but enough of a reminder that one might be coming that Aizawa had moved without thinking any more. He used his scarf for an extra layer of safety and leaned forward, clenching his arms around Midori's waist and throwing both of them backward away from the edge. Midori was limp in his arms, boneless like a lack of hope. I wish I wasn't nothing, said the kid, quiet nearly under his breath, not a plea, just a statement. I wish I wasn't worthless. Midori was far too complacent as Aizawa had arranged him in his arms and stood, carrying him like a much younger child. His eyes were still wide, blank and staring. Why can't I just be better? asked Midoriya, as Aizawa started heading back to the gate as fast as he could. Just enough. Aizawa needed all of his kids to be safe. He needed to be rational. There would be time to process whatever this was later. Yagi looked even worse than he had when Aizawa left. He was curled on the steps of the bus, where the students who already were retrieved were sleeping, like a shaking, guarding gargoyle, and his head snapped up. When he heard Aizawa approach, the sight of Midori in his arms might as well have been a bolt of lightning. He jerked forward, arms reaching out to both of them and making a wounded sound. Midoriya, he said, breathless. Is, is he, is Midoriya? He's fine, Aizawa said shortly, because he doesn't have time right now to explain what just happened, to explain that their student is currently limp and staring as if his soul had been plucked out of his chest. Here, he said instead. Take him. And he plopped Midori into Yagi's lap. Yagi's arms snake around him immediately, the entirety of his attention shifting to the kid, he ran his hands through Midoriya's curls and hugged him close, ducking his head as he did. Midoriya, for his part, seemed very willing to be cuddled like a comfort object. He turned his face into Yagi's chest and closed his eyes. Young Midoriya, young Midoriya, my boy, oh, my boy, I was so worried about you, said Yagi, a quiet litany fueled by the fear quirk. I was so worried. I'm so glad you're safe. He rocked the two of them back and forth, then swapped over to English, letting loose a quiet stream of nonsense. Little star, little prince, oh, my sweet, sweetheart son. Precious thing, I thought I lost you. I thought I lost you. Midori's hands fisted itself into Yagi's shirt, and his shoulders began to shake. Aizawa turned on his heel and headed over to midnight. He needed more of a quirk. He needed to get back out there. Next, Mike had directed him to Saro and Shoji, who were standing back to back in an empty courtyard, fighting viciously against something that he couldn't see. He heard Sarah roar at their invisible assailants that he knew what those bastards did to those kids with mutant quirks, and Aizawa wanted nothing more than to sit down and weep, because why had so many people been so cruel to these kids? Aizawa watched Sarah and Shoji succumb to fear faster than the rest of their classmates. They had already exhausted themselves before they started to inhale the gas. He signaled their locations to one of his peers. He sprinted on. 
Jiro stood with her back against a wall, a shaking finger pressed to her lips, the universal sign for be quiet. You need to be careful, Sensei, she breathed out as he approached her. They're going to hear you. Who's going to hear me, Jiro? Aizawa asked, even as she frantically signaled for him to hush. Them. She pointed, with a finger that wasn't against her lips, to an empty stop across the street from them. Aizawa said, I see, even though he didn't. Do you want me to make them go away, Jiro? Slowly, shakily, Jiro nodded her head. Aizawa broke the capsule in his palm and cupped it under her nose. Take a big breath in, he said, and she complied. Nothing like the snarky rebel who usually at least questioned his commands. She went down easily, and Aizawa caught her. She was one of the smallest students, and probably the lightest. She felt like nothing in his arms. You're sure they're in this building, Mike? Aizawa asked, walking carefully through the abandoned apartment complex. Yes, two of them, though they're not together. Different apartments, it looks like. I can get you to the correct apartment for each one, but you're on your own once you're inside. The trackers aren't that accurate. I can take it from there, then. I know you can, Eraser. Turn here. First one is the door on your right. Aizawa asked. Which one? Uraraka. Got it, said Aizawa, and then he opened the door and entered. He found Uraraka in the sagging kitchen. She paced back and forth, opening cabinets, gathering decades-old canned food and placing it on the table. She seemed eerily calm, moving with military-level precision, collecting the food, running her hands across the back of each of the cabinets to make sure that she didn't miss anything. She activated her quirk, floated a few inches off the ground to look and see for herself as well. Aizawa allowed the somnambulist to begin filling the room. Something in the way that she was standing made him feel like it was a bad idea to approach her, and he knew better than to doubt those instincts. Uraraka stared at the pile of food on the dust-covered table. There's not going to be enough, she said dully. She began to inhale the gas and sat down in one of the chairs when her knees began to feel weak. We're not going to have enough. She pulled back her fist, hit the table once hard enough to make Aizawa jump. There isn't going to be enough, she repeated, but angrier this time. Aizawa stayed in the doorway, heart beating unusually fast. This was such a quiet, adult fear. It looked wrong on Uraraka's narrow shoulders. She rested her head on her arms, fingers tangling through her hair, stress long lived in, fear but familiar. Aizawa carefully paced into the room and rested his hand on the back of her neck. She leaned up into it as if she'd known that he was there all along. Go to sleep, kid, Aizawa said, and let the adults worry about that. He said it like they lived in a world where that could be true. He said it and maybe he was saying it to soothe himself as much as he was soothing her. It was common knowledge within the faculty of UA that Todoroki Shoto was hiding something, something awful and painful and too delicate to talk about, which also meant that it was also too delicate for them all to press on. They knew this because Todoroki told it to him, in his wide-eyed confusion when confronted by praise and his strange, flinching reactions to normal movements, the way he and Midoriya went from barely acquaintances to nearly inseparable within the course of a few weeks. Todoroki Shoto was quiet and polite and kept his emotions perfectly schooled until they broke, he was a dedicated student, a good fighter. The staff even got to watch him begin to stumble into learning how to be a friend. But they all knew something was wrong. Now, as I was stared at the door of a coat closet, at the end of a hallway in a broken, abandoned apartment, he wished he'd push harder for this answer, instead of letting trust bloom slowly on its own. He reached out, grasped the handle, and pulled the door open. Todoroki had both hands over his nose and mouth, to muffle any sound even his breathing could make. Above them, his eyes were open, and wild and very, very young. He was pushed to the very back of the closet, tucked in to himself to become the smallest target possible. As if he wanted to fold himself completely out of existence, he shook. When the light hit his face, he had whimpered. Shit, Aizawa swore, and then fell into a crouch, made himself less of a tall, looming figure. He fumbled for one of the capsules in his belt. Hey, Todoroki, let's get you out of here, okay? Todoroki pushed himself further back against the wall, he moved his arms to cover his face as if blocking a blow. He's going to, he said in a voice that was small and muffled and nothing like the Todoroki Aizawa taught every day. He's going to find me. He won't, Aizawa swore, already writing up plans in his head to make that statement absolutely true. He's not going to find you. Not ever again. He broke the capsule as he slowly coaxed Todoroki out of his well-learned hiding spot carving another promise onto the insides of his ribs as he did. There was no doubt in Aizawa's mind that Kirishima saw dead bodies which weren't there right now. Kneeling in the center of the street, staring at an empty place in front of him, 
He was the picture of frozen devastation, arm half reached out in front of him, a hesitant, fluttering bird wanting to touch but unwilling to deal with the implications of that touch. He was muttering under his breath. Come on, Ajiro. You might still be able to save them. You can still save them. You know chest compressions, first aid. Just reach out and... God, stop being useless. Stop being so weak. Just reach out and... His hand floated another inch or so forward, before he snatched it back as if it were burned, cradling it to his chest. Move, Ajiro, he said, rocking himself back and forth. Come on, you idiot, move. But he didn't. He choked on a sob, and hardening began to climb up his arms. Stupid, stupid, come on, guys, please say something. Shit, shit, I... Kirishima crumpled. He pressed his forehead into the road. Aizawa had the sudden, horrifying mental image of him rearing his head back and slamming it into the concrete. He sent out his capture weapon and restrained the kid without another thought. Aizawa knew better than to try to talk to Kirishima at this point. It seemed like none of the kids who were this deep into the illusion had the power to see through it on their own. He cracked the capsule and waited for sleep to take Kirishima away from whatever he was seeing. His last student was sitting, still and calm as a picture, on the front steps of what used to be a bank. Asui had her chin sitting on her knees and her pinky finger in her mouth. She seemed to be chewing on it thoughtfully, a high fix somewhere else on the street. Her breathing was natural. She wasn't shaking. Aizawa walked up to her, slow and steady, his class is rock, steady and easygoing and kind, dependable even in her fear. He sat down next to her. Hello, Asui, he said, voice low and calm and steady. Slowly she turned her head to face him. Asui blinked a few times as if bringing his face into focus. She stared at Aizawa for a long second, and then her eyes began to well up with tears. I knew you would find me, she said. She sounded so much smaller than she usually did. I knew you would. That's what you're supposed to do when you're lost and scared, right? You, you stay where you are until an adult you can trust comes and finds you. And this, somehow, was what made Aizawa's eyes begin to flood over. He'd met Asui's mother before. She was a short, round woman who walked with a limp and kept her hair cut in a practical bob. She had every bit of her daughter's blunt kindness, and a sense of patience which could only come from raising four children. And she taught her daughter that, if she were ever lost, to stay calm and stay where she was and wait until someone came to find her, because someone would always come to find her. And Asui learned that lesson so deep in her heart that even... Pure, unnatural fear could not make her forget it. You found me, Sensei, said Asui, a bit wetly around the finger that she was still chewing. Yes, Asui, Aizawa said. I found you. And then he offered her his hand. Would you like to come home now? Asui nodded, placed the hand that she wasn't chewing on into his, a young, trusting gesture, despite the fact that their hands were nearly the same size. Yes, please, Mr. Aizawa. Is everyone else okay? Tears were still rolling serenely down her face. Yes, they're all waiting for us. Oh, that's good, Sensei. I'm really glad. Yeah, I am too. Carefully, the two of them stood up and began to walk toward the gate. Chapter 2. The Aftermath There was nothing to do but wait the quirk out. Snipe went and found the user, while Aizawa and the others had gathered his kids. Yagi's split-second analysis had been very apt. A young man shook and shuddered in front of him, ragged and homeless, and showing every sign of withdrawal from a common street-level downer, often used to self-medicate as a quirk suppressant. A classic story of a difficult-to-control villainous quirk and some kid who slipped through all the cracks, as if Aizawa needed another reason to hate the entire universe today. He refused to think about how he kept superimposing Hitoshi's slumped posture and tired eyes over this man's twitchy fidgeting. So Aizawa got the information he needed from the man, pretended his heart didn't ache for how he stuttered, and then left midnight to murmur to him about outreach programs and options and literally anything to do to get the guy some help. The quirk would wear off in something like 24 hours, because the kids already slept and woke up, the worst of it was probably already behind them. They would be jittery, anxious, on the brink of fear for more time yet, but they'd be able to hold on to reality. The more time that passed after the exposure, the more it would ease. Aizawa stepped back into the bus. They were nearly all awake now. It was a rarity for his class to be awake and all in the same room in this utterly silent. It feels just as unnatural as the empty ghost quarter that was behind them. They broke off into smaller groups while he was gone, spread out across the bus. Midori had been passed along, from Yagi to the ever-inseparable knot that was him, Uraraka, Ida, and Uraraka was in the window seat. 
drawn and small, and lying down over Ida, who was in the center, to rest her head on the opposite thigh. Midori sat in the aisle seat, tucked under Ida's arm, and pulled flush against his side. He was still listless and staring, but was already more alive than the near doll that Aizawa carried back to base barely an hour ago. Both of Ida's hands were buried in his friend's hair, gently stroking back and forth in a motion that was clearly just as much for his own comfort as it was for theirs. His eyes were still red-rimmed. Midori and Uraraka's fingers tangled together on the seat. Yagirozu replaced Midori at Yagi's side. She was hunched down, haunted-looking. Yagi, his own hands still shaking, was coaxing her into eating several of the protein cookies that he himself had made, which were almost entirely composed of some kind of weird American peanut butter he swore by. Sweet and filling and loaded with good fats, Yagi now carried them around with him constantly, shoving them into the hands of students who looked like they were flagging. Aizawa told himself he hated the annoying way their teaching styles had slotted together the more that Yagi grew into the profession. Him, the strict disciplinarian from whom praise was so hard-earned that it couldn't be anything but the truth, and Yagi, warm and open, with a constant supply of encouragement on his tongue and sweets in his bag. It was obnoxious. Aizawa felt nothing but contempt for it, really. Yagirozu desperately needed the food, and so Aizawa took her tiny nibbles of a cookie as a solid win. Across the aisle, and an arm's length away from where Midoriya, Ida, and Uraraka were braided together, Todoroki had pressed his forehead into the seat in front of him, eyes clenched shut, fighting a losing battle to gain back his composure. Asui took the window seat next to him, and sat sideways, staring fixedly at all four of the other kids. Occasionally she reached over to rum her long fingers in the space between Todoroki's shoulder blades. Tokiyami had retreated to the back corner of the last seat. Kaminari clung to Ojiro's hand as if it was the only thing in the universe that he was sure was real. Kirishi most practically in Saro's lap, and Saro didn't even seem likely to let him go any time soon. Bakugo glared out of the window as if the glass had personally offended him, though the way he allowed himself to be crowded into the window seat by Kirishima, in the first place, spoke volumes. A little proactive knot of some of the girls, Hagakure, Jiro, Ashido, had formed somewhere in the center of the bus. All nineteen pairs of eyes snapped to Aizawa as he stood next to the driver's seat. They stared at him with dull, well-worn faith, the blunt knowledge that they had been hurt, but Sensei was going to do his best to fix it. The thought dried out his throat, but Aizawa spoke around it. "'We just need to wait it out,' he said, and watched half of the class deflate, and pretended that it didn't feel like a failure in his chest. "'It should be completely gone by this time tomorrow, and it'll keep getting weaker the more that time passes. We're heading back to UA now. Sleep apparently helps, too. Get some rest. Try to hold it together until we can get back to the dorms.' He scanned his eyes over his kids. "'Does anyone feel like they can't hold it together until we get back to the dorms?' A long, heavy silence fell over the class. Introspection, self-evaluation of themselves and their peers. All nineteen of them were in full crisis mode. There was no room for pride or dishonesty. Slowly from the back of the bus, Tokiyami raised a quivering hand. Everyone else stayed down. I saw what beckoned the boy to the front of the bus. Mike entered, uncharacteristically quiet, and settled into the driver's seat. Behind them, the rest of the kids had shifted and prepared for the ride. Tokiyami sat down next to Aizawa, dark shadow hidden somewhere within him. The rumble the bus created as it moved was a useful screen of white noise, and Azawa turned to face his student, giving him as much space as he could. "'How's the arm?' he asked, nodding at the bandages. Tokiyami stared at them, clenching and unclenching a fist as he did so. "'It's fine,' he said, voice low and hoarse. "'We'll get Recovery Girl to take a glance at it when we get back. "'It's not deep. There's no need. "'How about you let her decide that kid?' Aizawa said, and Tokiyami had bowed his head. Aizawa gave him a moment, taking in the shivering tension in his shoulders, the way the opposite thumb had traced the seam of his bandages. "'Talk to me,' he said, short and to the point. Usually the best way to shock Tokiyami out of thought spirals he fell into, sometimes. Tokiyami's uninjured hand had floated up to clutch at the center of his chest. "'I,' he began, "'I was able to stop him from rampaging this afternoon.' "'You did?' said Aizawa levelly. You did very well. But you hurt yourself while doing so, which we always want to avoid. That doesn't matter, Tokiyami hissed with viciousness, which surprised his teacher, as he hunched into himself. It doesn't matter that I hurt myself. The point is that I did it. I was so terrified that I couldn't think properly, and I still stopped him from rampaging. Aizawa would have described it more as fear overriding a basic self-preservation instinct, but that probably wasn't a conversation for right now. Instead, he said... Okay. And, Tokiyami continued eyes squeezing shut, that means I could have. I could have stopped him. Back at 
back at the camp. Aizaba felt as if his own capture weapon had been snagged around his heart. I could have, and I didn't, and people got hurt, friends got hurt. Tokiyami continued, pain in every syllable. It was my fault, and it didn't have to be, because I stopped him today, and now I just keep thinking about that. It's all in my head, and it's very loud and very dark, and what if I can't control him until we get back to the school, Sensei, I don't want to cause pain, but what if I can't help it, I... Stop. Aizawa cut him off, as neat as possible. Tokiyami's beak had closed with a click. Aizawa gave him a moment to catch his breath before he continued speaking. What happened today and what happened at your training camp are two completely different situations, said Aizawa. He kept his voice low and firm. It is irrational and non-constructive to compare them. Can you tell me right now some ways that they're different? A long silence and so Aizawa added softer. It's okay if you can't. Tokiyami shook his head, squeezing his eyes shut as he did. That's okay. That's fine, Tokiyami. I'll tell you instead. Training camp was a more low-light environment. The danger there was more concrete and real, and your body reacted accordingly. You saw a classmate injured, and you reacted to that more than anything else. You also had less training then. Careful. Careful. Oh, he had to be so careful here. There were few worse things for someone to internalize than things will be better if I let myself hurt. Aizawa spoke slowly. What you did today was admirable. It was quick thinking under terrible circumstances, and I am damn proud of you for that, but I will always, always prefer you unharmed. Kid, can you look at me? After a moment, Tokiyami managed to look up and meet his eyes. I trust that you have enough control not to hurt other people with your quirk, he said firmly. I wouldn't let you continue training here if I had any doubt. When I was trying to find you, I was far more concerned about you getting yourself hurt. Dark Shadow appeared over his human shoulder, manifesting for the first time. What happened at the training camp? Continued Aizawa as he wondered if anyone had bothered saying this to the kid before now. Wasn't your fault. And when you're in a better state of mind, we're going to talk further about the fact that you feel like it is, okay? But for now, we're going to sit here, and you're going to match your breathing to mine until we get back to campus. Is that all right? Tokiyami rubbed his eyes with a fisted hand. It was an achingly young gesture, particularly from a student usually so focused on projecting maturity. Yes, he said. That's fine. All right. Aizawa sat back in his seat, letting out a small breath. Shouldn't be too long. Is there anything else I can do to help until then? His student didn't respond for a beat too long. Tokiyami? Could I have a hug? He blurted out and then fell into the puffed feather squirming motion that was his version of blushing. Aizawa was pulling the kid into his side before he could even think about it. Tokiyami pressed his forehead into Aizawa's ribcage, and Aizawa politely ignored it when his shoulders started to shake again. He ran a rough hand down the kid's back. Aizawa wasn't good at this mushy stuff, had never been, but if his kids needed a sturdy adult to lean on, then he'd be an entire tree. Dark Shadow started chewing on his capture weapon with a sad little trill. Aizawa looked across the aisle to where Yagi was in a similar position with Yayorozu, still trying to convince her to get more food down. Their eyes met, Yagi's pupils still blown. Behind them, the rest of their class spoke only in whispers and movements. They filed into the Height Alliance common room like 19 lost ducklings, bunched together and very small. Even Shoji, who was notably taller than Aizawa and had been since day one, projected an air of lost fragility. Last to enter was Sato, completing the duckling image with the way his fingers tangled into the hem of Kota's shirt, seemingly willing to follow wherever he was led. Aizawa stared at the huddle, Yagi a step behind him. No one is alone tonight, he addressed them all, including, though he'd never admitted himself. Is there anyone who's uncomfortable with being in the group? If you are, that's fine, we'll accommodate to it. He watched a few of the students consider it, Aoyama, who so dearly valued his image that he barely tolerated being seen wearing pajamas in the bathroom. Bakiko was still snapped at anyone who accused him of having friends. Jiro and her knee-jerk reaction against anyone seeing her vulnerable. In the end, none of them said anything. Okay, good. He checked his watch. You have two hours. Break into groups, do whatever you need to do. Shower, change, get comfortable. Wash today off your back and get back here within that time. Remember, he reiterated, no one's alone. Buddy system in full effect as of now. I'll be patrolling the halls. All Might will stay in the common room, and you all have my number. Call or yell if you need anything, but try to call, understood? He got nods in response, and a few soft iterations of Yes Sensei. Good. You got two hours. Go. I saw him watch his kids regroup, going through the motions that he hated were so well-practiced. Hiroshima pulled Bakugo to his side. 
by his shirt, and, tellingly, Makiko let him do it. Uraraka reached out and swapped herself with Todoroki, fitting him between Ida and Midoriya while she hooked arms with Asui. Midoriya looked more alive than he had in hours, and Todoroki had slumped into his side and braced to meet him. Jiro and Yayorosu had linked hands. They trickled out of the common areas in twos and threes, and one instance fours. Aizawa had moved to the kitchen, intending to pull out one of the bulk meals from lunch rush, as they had frozen for emergencies and started warming up. But he felt a large hand wrap around his upper arm and stop him. Aizawa stopped, turned, looked up into Yagi's face. What? Take a second for yourself, Aizawa, he said, eyebrows drawn slightly together. You've had an ordeal as well. At least go and change into a different uniform, covered in dirt and ash. I... Aizawa glanced down at himself and discovered that, infuriatingly, Yagi wasn't wrong. Someone needs to be here. I'm fairly certain I'm currently physically unable to be in a place where I couldn't protect those kids, said Yagi with a wry smile. He spread his shaking hands in demonstration. One of us should be allowed to take a breather. You can help them more once you've taken care of yourself. Aizawa pushed his lips together. Once again, he wasn't wrong, but... I don't want to leave only you here, Yagi, when you were hit by the quirk as well, no matter how well you're handling it at this point. Wait, hold on. His eyes narrowed as he came to a realization. You haven't slept yet, have you? Since being hit with a quirk, no, I haven't. So there's no way it's worn off for you as much as it has for the kids, Aizawa said flat. Ah. Yagi hooked one of his hands to the back of his neck, offering a sheepish smile as he did. Probably not. But, to be completely honest, Aizawa, this level of hypervigilance would have been very close to my baseline in the year or two leading up to my first fight with All for One. So I might just be used to it. Aizawa stared at him for a long second before pressing the heels of his hands to his eyes because he spent his entire life around two happy, traumatized morons. Please, he said. Please, for the love of God, go to counseling. Yagi gaped at him, then snorted, half-smiling. Tell you what, I will when you do. Aizawa offered a rude hand gesture, though not before glancing around the room to be sure none of the kids were lingering to see it. Then, just to be safe, he asked, You can handle it here if I leave for five minutes. Yagi gave a thumbs up. You can take ten, even. Warm up the food when I'm gone, Aizawa said, and then took the chance to duck out of the room and up into his apartment. It only took him a few seconds to shed his utility belt, gear, and jumpsuit. He went into the bathroom, spent a heavy second staring longingly at the shower, then ran the tap sink in the lukewarm water and... Stuck his hand under it. Aizawa combed his fingers through his damp hair, working out the snarls, and letting particles of the ghost quarter run down the drain. He grabbed a washcloth and ran it with quick, efficient hands over his hands and arms and his shoulders. He didn't need to be spotless, he just needed to be functional. That done, Aizawa had ran the tap cold, cupped his hands and splashed his face several times. He braced against the sink and took a long, deep breath, avoiding looking in the mirror. Hey, he asked his own emotions, knocking at the specially crafted door inside his head. Are you ready to feel us yet? Aizawa firmly shut that door in their face and locked it. He took another breath. There would be time later for him to feel and process everything that happened today, but whether that processing was going to happen in his own bed or curled up on Hisashi's couch was yet to be seen. Either way, it was for later. This wasn't about him. This was about making sure his kids didn't crash. Aizawa dried his face and left the bathroom. He shrugged into another jumpsuit, foregoing the utility belt, then tucked his phone charger into his pocket. He checked the time. Seven minutes. Not bad. He went back to the dorm's common room, planning on checking in with Yagi before patrolling the halls to check on the kids, but stopped dead in the doorway. Sometime in the seven minutes he'd been gone for, Ashido had come back downstairs, changed into sweats. She was sitting balled up against the wall, in a corner, hair mussed up and face tight. Yagi was seated next to her. A foot or two of space between them, mimicking her stance and posture, he kept his eyes straight ahead, deliberately not looking at her. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know nothing happened, Sensei. I'm being a baby, I just I can't, I don't... Aizawa wanted to walk into the room, join Yagi by her side, but was stopped by a flick of Yagi's fingers. He made the hero standard hand sign for all good here. It's fine, young Ashido. You have nothing to apologize for, but... Could you try to slow your breathing for me a bit? In and out... There you go. I c can't. I... I'm sorry. I don't feel safe. Nothing's wrong. Why can't I feel safe? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yagi said, voice soothing. I saw noticed how his hand still shook. How about this? Can you look around the room and tell me three ways you could exit it if you needed to? What? If you were actually unsafe, what are three ways you could leave and get to a safer place? 
That was not a standard grounding exercise to give to kids. That was one that Aizawa gave to other underground heroes after pulling them out of months-long deep cover missions. But Aizawa couldn't fault Yagi for it. Not when Ashido looked up with such purpose, her tight shoulders loosening with every word she spoke. The front door, the window, it doesn't open all the way, but I can melt it upstairs and down the fire escape. Good, good job. Yagi caught Aizawa's eye from where he sat on the floor, flicked through the hand signs again, all good here. He signed, followed by, proceed with mission. Aizawa nodded once. He glanced quickly across the room, checking to make sure that the oven was on appropriately low enough temperature and a timer was set for the food, keeping half an ear on the conversation behind him as he did. How about three things you could defend yourself with if something happened to make you feel unsafe? Aizawa moved to the stairs and started climbing, Ashido's voice fading behind him, growing steadier with each word. My quirk, th the lamp, it's pretty heavy, and you... Me, young Ashido. W yeah, you're all might after all. Aizawa could just hear Yagi cough in shock before he stopped being able to hear them at all. Aizawa walked through the hallways, attempting to be as unobtrusive as possible, a presence but only if he was a desired one. The last thing that would help any of them was him acting like a hovering parent. He had to trust his kids to come to him if they needed him, or if one of their peers could get him if they couldn't. He came across Kaminari, Yagirozu, and... Jiro and one of the stairways squeezed together on one step, Kaminari in the middle. Kaminari was also kneading a stuffed lion between his hands, and Aizawa recognized it as Yagirozu's work. Normally he would scold that. She'd already been a hair's breadth away from collapsing on work overuse today, but Kaminari was squeezing it so viciously that it was obviously his hands needing to do something else before they were occupied by the toy, and Aizawa had paused several steps away from them, and they didn't notice he was there. Words were tripping out of Kaminari's mouth. It was like everything got dark and small, and the whole world was just me, and I knew I was too much of a fuck-up to ever fix it, and shit, all I could do was cry. What kind of a hero cries in the face of fear, like, I cried, Kaminari. Yagirozu said, voice low. I cried, then nearly made myself faint with how badly I misused my power, so I also made myself a liability. These kids. These kids were going to destroy Ozawa's heart. He already knew it. Maybe, given the way said organ was twisting at the moment, they already had. Jiro spoke up forceful. Yeah, and I froze in place like a useless moron. The two others made protesting noises, and she pushed herself into Kaminari in retaliation. He ended up folding into Yayarozu's side, and Yayarozu turned to wrap her arms around the both of them. Jiro continued. The quirk did what the quirk was supposed to do. We weren't prepared for it, and we freaked. It happens, and we learn from it. No one's useless or a bad hero or a liability. Don't you dare say it again, either of you, because I don't let people talk about my friends that way. Kaminari whined in his throat and tucked his head into Yayarozu's shoulder. Aizawa chose this moment to make himself known. You kids all done up here. He felt bad for the way that they jumped, but they relaxed instantly when they realized it was him. No, sensei, said Jiro, unrepentant. We got sidetracked. Aizawa hummed. Well, why don't you all unsidetrack yourselves and get moving? The sooner you do, the sooner everyone's back downstairs. Yes, Mr. Aizawa, they murmured nearly as one. Aizawa hesitated a moment and then reached out to run a hand through Kaminari's hair, tossing it slightly. It crackled with static underneath his fingers. Ashido is downstairs and could probably use a friend right now, he said, resting his other hand on Yayarozu's head. He didn't reach out to Jiro, already knowing it would be unwelcome. I'd suggest you all join her. Nina, Kaminari said, worry etched in his voice. All might is with her, don't worry, but I'm sure she'd prefer someone her own age rather than boring old people, wouldn't you agree? The three of them got up, leaning against each other, and the railing for leverage. Aizawa was sure that he heard a not even close to boring from one of them as they moved to one of their rooms. Next, Aizawa paused at Sato's door, offering a gentle reminder that stress baking in this state was certainly more of a fire hazard than a stress reliever. He passed Tokiyami, who was already heading back downstairs, wrapped in a fluffy black blanket like it was a wizard's cloak. Shoji was stationed at the door of the boys' bathroom, and when questioned, said that Aoyama had been showering for fifteen minutes and had five more before Shoji went to talk him out. Kirishima's door was firmly shut, but Saro stood outside of it, stiff and on guard. Every bit a dutiful sentry, and Aizawa paused in front of him. Everything all right in there? He asked, nodding at the closed door. Behind it he could hear voices rising and falling, Kirishima's clear tenor and Bakugo's low register. Snippets of the conversation filtered out. I'm right here, hair for brains. Don't know what I need to do to convince you. To convince yourself, you're acting like... I wouldn't let them anyway. 
Don't fucking need anyone's. Isn't something only you need, Kotsky. Fuck, listen to me. Maybe it's something I also... They're working it out, Saro said to Aizawa, his usually smiling mouth pressed into a straight line. Good, said Aizawa, because he believed it. Bakugo opened up stiffly, painfully, and to very few people. Kirishima was one of them. Aizawa would, of course, prefer the kid to talk to a teacher about certain things, but they'd take it one step at a time. Everything was a process, the way Bakugo had tempered and grown already, after only a few months of having friends jostle him around, was nothing short of a miracle. Then Aizawa said, Are you all right? Because Saro was still in his gym uniform and still had sweat and dirt streaked onto his face. Saro was quiet for a long moment. I don't. He started, then stopped, swallowed thickly, and then began again. I don't want to just leave them here, without anyone to watch their backs. I see, said Aizawa. That's very noble of you, Saro, but you do need to go and take care of yourself, too. Saro's face screwed up alarmingly, and Aizawa pushed on. Would you like me to watch the door for a little bit while you go and change? Saro swayed forward, looking tempted, but paused. I... Aizawa placed a hand on his shoulder and squeezed. You know I'll take care of them, if anything happens. He said, quiet and strong. Saro closed his eyes. Yeah, okay, Sensei, just stay here until I get back. I'll only be a second, I promise. You can take more than a second, even, said Aizawa to the kids retreating back as he took up his guard outside of Kirishima's door. After Saro came back and he gave a reminder of the time left before they were all planning on being back downstairs, Aizawa went and actually knocked on Ida's door. There was a shuffle from within, before the door cracked open and Ida himself had peeked out. Ah, he said. He was wearing a pair of sweats and an oversized, overwashed long sleeve shirt, which Aizawa was almost certain belonged to Tensei at one point. His glasses were off and hooked onto the collar of his shirt. Hello, Mr. Aizawa. I just wanted to check on you three, said Aizawa, because he was sure that Todoroki and Midoriya were both hidden behind the mostly closed door. Right, said Ida. Uh, yes, we're all fine. The other two just needed a moment or so here to, um, catch their breaths, I suppose. Some more time with no adults, Aizawa heard, whether Ida knew he was saying it or not. All right, he said. That's fine, thank you for telling me, though if you could let Midori and Todoroki know something for me. Ida stared at him for a beat. Of course, he said. Thank you, said Aizawa, and he raised his voice slightly as he spoke. He knew that Midori and Todoroki were likely sitting frozen on Ida's bed, listening to every word. Please let them know that my first priority as a teacher is always the health and safety and well-being of my students, he said slow and clear. And were there anything in any of my students' lives which was affecting their health, safety, and well-being, and they were to tell me about it, my first action would be to do whatever I could to resolve that situation in my students' favor. He heard the two muffled intakes of breath from behind Ida, but pushed on. No matter what the problem was, internal or external, that student would not be met with doubt. They would not be met with expulsion. They would be met with help. All they would need to do is ask for it. I faced down the press for Bakugo. I'd do that and more for any and all of my students. Ida gaped at him. At a complete loss for words, behind the door Midoriya and Todoroki made no noise at all. Aizawa lowered his voice next and spoke directly to Ida. They're both worth fighting for, after all, don't you think? I... Ida tilted his head at Aizawa, oddly soft. I can think a few more worthy sensei. Hmm. Aizawa turned on his heel, preparing to pace down the rest of the hallway. Well, there's you as well, Ida, he said, and heard the boy make a choked noise behind him. Remember to head downstairs soon, all three of you. We can talk more in depth tomorrow. Mr. Aizawa? Also, we met him in the hall. She had her index finger in her mouth again, chewing gently. Aizawa stopped. Yes, Asui. Is everything okay? I'm fine, Mr. Aizawa, she said, but reached out a hand to him regardless. Could you come with me, though, please? Of course. Aizawa let himself be pulled along. Where are we going? You need to talk to Ochako, she stated, and yes, they were heading in the direction of Uraraka's room. Uraraka was seated in the center of her bed, a pillow hugged to her chest, tears dripping down her face. Asui hung by the door while Aizawa slowly entered the room, tapping his knuckles on the doorframe as he did. Can I come in, Uraraka? he asked. She responded by burying her face in the pillow. She didn't say anything. Aizawa did not walk forward any more. I can stay here, if that would make you more comfortable, he said. Could you tell me what's wrong? Uraraka shook her head, squeezing her pillow tighter. Behind him, Asui spoke up. Really, thank God for Asui, when this entire ordeal was... Over, he needed to remember to tell her what an excellent job she did. 
Ochako is embarrassed, she said. But she saw how she acted when she was scared. Is that true, Uraraka? After a long pause, there was a nod in the pillow. I don't... I don't... She said, muffled by the fabric, but Aizawa could hear her clear as day. I don't want you to think differently of me now. Aizawa still did not enter the room. Why would I think differently of you? B because... Her voice was thick with tears. Because people always do. They say they don't, but they do. And it was so nice to have it hanging over me and not have everyone know. But now, I don't have that anymore. And... And... Uraraka. Aizawa cut her off. Could I please come in? Y yes, Sensei. He crossed the room to her, knelt in front of the bed, coaxed the pillow away from her face. The apples of her cheeks were even more red than usual. You are one of my brightest students, he said slowly. Hard-working, practical, an impressive streak of kindness. That is what I'm always going to see when I look at you. Not your past, not your home situation, not a terrible moment under a fear quirk in that apartment building. I am teaching a talented, bright young woman. Nothing is going to change that perception. But, Aizawa held up a hand. Do I treat Ida differently because he comes from a hero family? No, Sensei. Have I ever treated you and your female classmates differently from your male peers? No, Mr. Aizawa. How could you even... Then this is no different. He cut her off again. It doesn't change anything, Uraraka. If it's a problem for you and you want to talk about it, my door is open to have that conversation, as is the rest of the faculty. If there's... Someone else you feel more comfortable with, but my opinion of you is the same as it was a day ago. The Uraraka keened high in her throat, then flung herself forward, and Aizawa had to catch her in a hug. He exhaled roughly, ran a hand down her back. He'd never had a class so into hugging before, or at least not one so determined to pull him into hugs as well. I'm sorry, he said. That today happened. You were forced into a very vulnerable position that you shouldn't have been in, and I saw that moment even though you would have rather I didn't. And that's terrible, but I'd never judge you on that action. Not ever. Y you're... Uraraka sniffled into his shoulder. Y you're a really amazing teacher, Sensei. Aizawa exhaled. He'd argued that no, he wasn't. He was barely passable, certainly not doing a very good job at protecting this group. And this kind of respect was the bare minimum for a teacher, in his opinion. But instead he said, Yeah, yeah. And eased her back as he stood up. He glanced back at Asui, who was staring at them with a tilted head and a small smile on her face. "'I think we're ready to go downstairs now, Sensei,' she said, and Uraraka nodded. The common room was swathed in blankets. Hagakure must have gutted her entire collection of soft things and dumped them into the center of the room for people to grab, though Aizawa could see a few offerings from Aoyama and Midoriya, as well as individual pieces that people brought for themselves. Every surface possible was covered in an extra blanket or a pillow, usually more than one. There were also, as Awa noticed, a truly heartbreaking number of plush toys of all shapes and sizes, and levels of wear, as if he needed another reminder today of how young all these kids were. Kirishima holding onto a faded, red, ragged stuffed bear was almost too much to handle. Ojiro and Aoyama were in the kitchen, doling the food into bowls and passing them out. Yagi had been trapped in an armchair, an arm's length away from where Midori and Todoroki sat. They were in front of the couch, while Ida had curled up like a cat on top of the same couch behind them. Midori had smiled weakly as they entered the room that made grabby hands toward Uraraka and Asui. Both of them had peeled away from Aizawa and headed over, Asui joining Ida on the couch and Uraraka tossing herself onto the floor next to Todoroki. Bakugo's little self-proclaimed squad had claimed the other couch, Ashido, who had calmed down significantly, and Kaminari in the center. Bakugo was on the very edge, squished into the arm. The rest of the kids had fanned out around the room, Hagekure with Yayorozu and Jiro, saving a spot for Ojiro the same way Sato was saving a spot for Aoyama. Tokiyami and Shoji took up the love seat. Aizawa did a head count, was about to leave the room to pick up their last straggler, when Koda had slipped in all on his own, with his rabbit in his arms. He crossed the room to Yagi, poured the rabbit onto his lap, then went to go help Ojiro and Aoyama with the food. Yagi stared down at the animal for a moment in shock, then his lips twitched up, and he moved his still trembling hands up to pet the creature slowly, glancing around at Midori as he did. Midori smiled back. Soon everyone was settled, quietly eating, all leaning against each other. Aizawa felt a swell of, a swell of something, coming from behind his heart. He'd never had a class like this before, never had a class wield their closeness like a sword and a shield against the world which had proved time and time again that it was out to hurt them. It was heartening, and at the same time it was hurtful to look at. 
Given how misty-eyed Yagi looked, he was thinking similar thoughts. As the bowls of food began to be emptied and set aside, Aizawa stood up in front of his class, felt the weight of each individual eye as they turned on him. "'You all did very well today,' he said, voice level. "'I know it might not feel like it, but you did. You were all in a terrible, unexpected situation, and you all performed admirably.' From the corner of his eye, Aizawa saw Tokiyami shrink into himself and Shoji gently flick his arm in protest— Ida pushed his lips together and slowly raised his hand. "'I suppose, Sensei,' he said. "'But it is hard to feel like that when some of us had such extreme reactions. I ran away. That doesn't feel like performing admirably in the face of fear.' It was a powerful quirk, Aizawa countered. "'That you all even had the presence of mind to scatter in the first place is impressive.' "'Yeah, Ida,' Midori leaned back, knocked his head back against Ida's shin. "'Don't feel too bad. At least running is somewhat useful.' Scared me, decided it was a great idea to go on top of a roof. The noise that tore itself from Bakugo's throat was inhuman. An emotion so violent that Aizawa reached for his non-existent capture scarf, Bakugo threw himself over the arm of the couch. Lunging for Midori, he grabbed the other boy's face between both of his hands, forcing eye contact, faces inches away from each other. Bakugo's breath was hitching, uneven. He seemed unable to form words. His eyes were wild, darting, something horrified and desperate behind them that... Aizawa could not even begin to decode. Midori himself seemed frozen, his own eyes wide, mouth open and a gaping little, oh. Deku. Bakugo spoke like a battle. Deku. Understanding flooded Midori's face, and it was ten times more painful than the confusion. His mouth twisted, slowly raised his hands to cut Bakugo, still pressing on either cheek. Not right now, Kachan, he said, squeezing his eyes shut. Not right now. Daisawa knew that there was something, twisted, ugly in their shared history, something broken. But feeling it flood the room around them, it suddenly seemed like something more painful than he might have guessed. Makako stared for another charged second. Then he hissed through his teeth, screwed his own eyes closed. He surged forward and knocked his forehead with Midoriya's in something that was closer to a headbutt than a tap. He pressed and, after a moment, Midori pressed back. Then Makako had flung himself backward, back onto the couch, crashing into Kirishima's side. The momentum pushed Midoriya into Uraraka and Todoroki's waiting arms. For a moment, it looked like Bakugo was going to flee the room, but Kirishima grabbed onto a handful of his shirt and hung on. The moment, as suddenly as it came, had passed, absorbed into the blankets and the pillows around them. The only sound was Bakugo's ragged breathing, quiet sniffles from Midoriya. That was something else to be dealt with then, and judging from Yagi's face, it was something that Aizawa didn't have all the information to handle just yet, but that was okay. For tonight, that could be okay. Tonight was not about new battles, it was about ensuring that this battle had a soft landing. You all kept yourselves safe until I came to get you, Aizawa said, speaking louder, drawing attention back to himself. That was perfect, so I'll reiterate, you all did very well. His class looked back at him, and if they looked a little less dead-eyed, then, well, that was what tonight was about, more than anything. I'm going to be here all night, said Aizawa. As will All Might. If you need anything, let us know. If anything feels wrong, let us know. If you feel too scared or anxious to let us know, for quirk reasons or otherwise, tell one of your peers, and your peer will let us know. Am I understood? A ripple of Yes Sensei goes throughout the room, and yeah, he's definitely seeing some smiles now. Good, he said, and went to go grab a bowl of food for himself. Izawa turned around in the kitchen and looked at the common area to behold, well, it looked like a slumber party, if a progressively mixed-gendered one. The students were warm, safe, together, clean and fed, and leaning against each other. Heads on shoulders, legs over laps. Koda was putting a documentary about marine life and coral reefs onto the television. With every hour, the fear quirk had faded more. Tomorrow, there will be time to sort the rest of the problems out, coax an answer out of Todoroki, out of Midoriya, counseling appointments for all of them, including, if Aizawa has any say in it, Yagi. And then Yagi would insist that Aizawa go too, be backed up by Hizashi because the both of them were bastards. But this was enough, Aizawa thought, and felt an incredible wave of peace pass over him. For tonight, he let this be enough. All right, everyone, this concludes the fic, Things That Haunt Our Hallways. I hope you all enjoyed this one. I really like that it was done entirely from Aizawa's perspective, as he's helping all these kids. Let me know your thoughts and reactions, though, because it's one that I reread constantly. And as always, thank you all so much for listening.